Great. Good morning. Uh, today is April 6th. Uh, this is the House Committee on Environment and Energy, and we are back on S5. This morning, we have with us um, uh, a number of witnesses who can talk with us um, about uh, housing uh, and weatherization. And we'll start this morning with Sue Minter. We'll have about an hour uh, here with Sue and Paul Zabriskie, Kathy Beyer, and Maura Collins. So Sue, welcome. Thanks very much. Are you able to hear me? We are. Great, and I appreciate um, your letting me go first. I apologize for having to hop off uh, soon after my remarks, but Paul is available to answer any questions that may come up. So I am Sue Minter, um, Executive Director of Capstone Community Action, and joining me is Paul Zabriskie, the Director of Capstone's Weatherization and Climate Impact uh, Program. And just quickly, uh, Capstone is a, uh, anti-poverty nonprofit organization founded in 1965, working to really overcome poverty by serving people in crisis and uh, offering opportunities to build ladders out of poverty. Our programs are very uh, multifaceted. Uh, they include emergency food assistance, heating assistance, housing counseling, homelessness prevention, uh, savings and credit coaching, businesses, workforce development, and home weatherization uh, services, as well as Head Start. We serve um, the communities of Lamoille, Orange, and Washington County, Central Vermont, uh, primarily, although some of our weatherization services are statewide. Um, and for all of these services, we provide uh, help for over 10,000 Central Vermonters who are struggling uh, with their low incomes. I wanna start by explaining that uh, my board of directors has not uh, approved or even really contemplated the details of this complex bill, S5. So I don't speak uh, for Capstone. I speak uh, on behalf of myself uh, as well. The Vermont Community Action Partnership, VCAP, the network of community action agencies has not taken a position on this bill. So again, uh, I just wanna make it clear, I'm not speaking on their behalf or on behalf of Capstone officially. Um, I wanna recognize that I have uh, served uh, also on the Vermont Climate Council as an appointee from the Senate. So I do uh, really appreciate your inviting me to provide perspective. Uh, it's a clear from our climate action plan that transportation and thermal energy are you know, the greatest contributors and therefore the most important for us to address. Uh, Capstone is working in both of those sectors. Um, and I feel strongly we have to change, we have to innovate, and we have to facilitate a transition to reduce carbon emissions, but also being mindful of the potential impacts. And as I think you know, the Global Warming Solutions Act calls for what we call a just transition, which, among other things, really has to seek to support and not undermine vulnerable and frontline communities. So I support the groundbreaking approach uh, to um, advancing this transition within the thermal section sector that I think S5 really represents. I feel strongly we have to move forward uh, toward burning cleaner uh, forms of energy sources that uh, can be more locally owned and generated. Doing nothing ignores the reality that in addition to the high costs of carbon, our current system is both costly and volatile. Now, from my vantage point at Community Action, I see this transition as most critical for the most vulnerable Vermonters who we serve. Uh, these are Vermonters who share the greatest energy burden and who are the most vulnerable to both the cost shocks and climate disruption. They're also the least able to recover from climate disasters. And as the former Irene recovery officer in 2011, serving in that position to, for two years, I personally saw how those most impacted by that historic flood were also the least able to respond and the longest to recover. 
which is, I think, why we have to have an eye on the impacts of the transition on frontline and vulnerable communities. So while I'm supportive of the approach uh, with the view I have um, about the demand uh, for energy, but also the challenges of helping our Vermonters stay warm, I also have serious concerns about anything that could exacerbate our current challenges. And I say this in a particular window into the world of those who struggle. And I just want to sort of share what it's like uh, at the front lines of helping very um, low income and very low income Vermonters. You know, um, I want you to understand both our mission and some of the stories. Our, our winter services begin to ramp up in October when cold really arrives. And our fuel season becomes very, very stressful uh, for folks, uh, both answering the phones to kind of assess the needs of folks, whether people may be eligible for our services, uh, and especially for our six direct service staff in um, the total region I described. So even though this winter has been relatively warm, um, the extreme jump in fuel costs has meant that we are working through every source of funds. In fact, we've pretty much uh, depleted those funds to help more people, especially more people who are above the eligibility threshold for crisis services. Uh, just to give you the numbers, we have fielded since October through February, 2097 calls. That's just in central Vermont for people who need emergency energy services. We've helped over 890 people uh, and provided 670 actual crisis service supports. That's for fuel, electricity, pressure tests, tip charges, relights. We've obligated over $457,000 for uh, those services. That's a combination of LIHEAP and crisis fuel but also from a variety of uh, donated funds that we work incredibly, incredibly hard to provide, to raise. And you know, the people needing assistance from us are from all walks of life, but the majority of these people are elderly or on a fixed income. Uh, they may be living with a disability or living with others in a with a disability. So these are folks who, as our staff call, are very living very close to the bone. They have no ability to adjust to increases in fuel prices. And even though this has been a relatively warm winter, it has been a super dramatic and stressful winter because of the escalation of prices, not only for heating fuel, but for food, for basic needs. And it is that combination of, of challenge that brings folks to us. Just one example, um, we had for the first time in many, uh, many years, uh, an increase in the COLA, the cost of living adjustment for folks living on social security. Uh, but we had uh, a couple come in, and I think it's the first of many, who since January have received a $200 monthly jump bump in their social security income. But that has meant they are no longer eligible for crisis services. So they receive, uh, to be eligible for this couple, um, they receive just above the, what would be a $32,000 annual income for a couple, a family of two to be eligible for our services. So they uh, no longer can receive the public subsidy of 900 for their fuel assistance. Now, thankfully, um, we work really hard to not have to say no to folks. And uh, we raise uh, money through our Fuel Your Neighbors, our Wheels for Warmth, uh, the Warmth Program through our utilities um, and our town meeting requests. So we were able to help this couple, uh, but for many more, we are not, or we fear that we are not. Um, I just um, could go on with just for a second, the many ways in which folks we serve are being hit by the reduction and the element ending of pandemic era funding, such as the extended emergency allotment of SNAP benefits. I'm not gonna go on to that, but simply to say we are in really hard times and they're getting much harder. Um, 
I want to just really call out and thank um, the committee for the part of the bill that does recognize those needs, um, specifically support the equitable distribution of the clean heat measures that are set forth in the bill. I greatly appreciate that you are working to prioritize the customers with low and moderate incomes because they are those with highest energy burdens and including renters. Um, and I especially appreciate that you're looking for so-called installed measures. Um, those may be more costly at the outset, but we know, um, and certainly Paul knows, that this is long-term and lasting uh, benefits to the folks we serve. Statewide, I think you know that community action agencies uh, are the um, pre providers of weatherization assistance, uh, subsidized weatherization assistance to low-income folks. And I want you to know that statewide uh, is our understanding that we've um, produced uh, investments, weatherized um, over 1,000, 1,033 units, uh, which is about 79% of the goal we had set statewide, about 279 short. Now, what that is producing is an average of 28% of the costs of that unit that that uh, individual has spent on fuel. So an ongoing reduction of that kind of cost is the most important investment we can make to serve the folks who then no longer have to come to us for those emergency allotments I was speaking of. Um, we work incredibly hard, um, and yet the progress is complex and slow. We have workforce challenges that we are working incredibly hard to overcome, um, and we can speak further to those. Uh, but they are real. Nevertheless, uh, you, the Global Warming Solutions Act has set forth very ambitious um, targets for us that we're doing everything we can to try to reach. Capstone um, has uh, weatherized on its own over 171 units. Uh, we also have a program, the 3E Thermal, looking at multi-family units that completed work on 211 residential units. Uh, all of these are incredibly important and long-lasting savings, and we appreciate how much this bill um, sets forth ambitious and support uh, and important supports for this program. Um, I want to say that um, I know the Global Warming Solutions Act sets a, an aggressive timetable uh, for this transition, uh, and we are working uh, very hard to try to reach that. But I do recognize that um, and worry that that sets uh, a, a price a challenge for this to meet the, especially the near term targets. Um, and I want to request um, that you place some kind of a monitoring mechanism to help evaluate potential unintended impacts um, and especially the impacts on low income Vermonters. Um, in addition, I of to tracking and analyzing these impacts, I would recommend that you consider additional supports for programs like the LIHEAP crisis fuel assistance that have very limited eligibility, but might be able to further ameliorate some of the impacts on those low-income folks. Um, and that's really uh, what I wanted to share uh, from my personal vantage point. Again, not um, formal um, support for this by my board or the network of CAPS, but uh, really just to try to present what's happening on the ground with people struggling to afford our current system and to recognize that our currently we are struggling because we have uh, uh, we depend on sources of fuel supports that are volatile uh, and that are from being imported. Um, thank you. I will uh, leave it there and see if you have questions now or if you hold them to the end. I know Paul will be available. Okay. Does anybody have uh, questions for Sue? Knowing that we will have Paul with us all the way through. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Andrew. Um, Good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, you you just mentioned additional support to LIHEAP for the range. If I recall, uh, LIHEAP goes up to 60% annual median income. I think you are right. Um, 
and what would be helpful in terms of the range to be able to provide more services to people if right now it goes to 60 percent? You know, I think this is a very complex topic of how this program is supporting uh, folks, and I don't want to set a, a, a limit right now, but I think there are various types of support within this whole LIHEAP program that I would welcome the opportunity to have uh, a deeper dive with folks from the state and from the CAP network um, to really think, uh, I guess, more holistically about um, this, the mm -hmm. program as a whole. And I guess just if I don't know if everyone in this committee knows what LIHEAP is. Does everyone know? Yeah. Could you just explain LIHEAP? For a moment, because because we have some new folks to the committee, and the committee was merged from last year. And I think it would be great for you to have folks from the state in. Um, what I can tell you, low income heating assistance program, LIHEAP, uh, which is a federal funding that comes through um, the Department of Children and Families, and I cannot testify to all of the different aspects of this program. I what we rely on is emergency heating assistance, uh, where we are determining the eligibility of folks and um, sending the information and the fuel uh, dealers are providing those services. Um, and so it isn't like we are giving um, funding from the feds directly to our clients unless they are not eligible, and we have the ability to support them. I think um, there are different kinds of supports that I don't feel um, able to testify, but would be welcome uh, to bring uh, the right staff, or most importantly, for you to get the right staff from the state to discuss it. But it is really the way that our state and federal government supports very low-income people who cannot afford to keep their homes heated through the winter. And what I can tell you is we are not meeting that need, even in spite of the, the generosity of this program. And it's because the eligibility is so narrow. Uh, we work incredibly hard at Capstone. We've raised over $300,000 from our neighbors through our Fuel Your Neighbors program because so many of the people in need don't meet the eligibility requirements, which is why I'm saying if this program is putting a more acute pressure on those uh, folks, this would be the, the place to look at the determination of an eligibility and mm -hmm. the possible flexibility. You know, the example of someone relying on Social Security who is able to get a COLA increase but is no longer eligible for the fuel assistance is a perfect example of how these different programs are not integrated. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Sue. And uh, next up, we will hear from Paul. I want to be cognizant um, that we do need to get um, more Collins on her way by 10 o'clock. Representative Logan. Um, thank you. Um, I do have a quick question for probably, you know, there are multiple people who could answer this today. Um, one of the um, pieces of information I think that would be helpful for us is understanding at the state level um, how many households fall under um, the or fall within the category of low to moderate income, given that we're using HUD standards for calculation of low and moderate income status. Um, the um, and ANR uh, provided some numbers, but they were based on HMI, household median income, rather than AMI. Um, so that's a very, very different number. Okay. Um, the other um, comment I just wanted to make uh, regarding, um, you know, the increase in Social Security, the coal increase for Social Security. Social Security, as I understand it, given <laughs> given that my father was in a similar situation this year, um, uh, part of the reason that these folks are ineligible for services is because of the use of AMI as the standard and HUD will not adjust AMI until this month. So there was a three month period where COLA increased for Social Security, you know, lagged behind HUD increasing the uh, AMI calculations. 
So good information for us as we continue to work through. Um, Matt. Madam Chair or Vice Chair, I, I want to just say it, it it's such an important point that, you know, you're looking to certain eligibility and, and different federal programs and different federal agencies uh, really determine uh, what uh, poverty means uh, in different ways. And it is complicated. And I think the more we understand the, the whole set of challenges, uh, the better off we'll be in, in thinking about these programs. I don't know if, Paul, um, I might have mistake, misspoke or that there's an additional point that he wanted to make relative to the question I just answered. Um, just uh, LIHEAP in Vermont is currently 185% of federal poverty. 60% uh, of median income, which is a, a metric used in the bill, S5 uh, is nominally relates to about 200% of federal poverty. So there is a, a little bit of a mismatch there. And again, my name is Paul Zabriskie for the record. Great. Okay. Uh, other brief questions. Yes. I just like to add, uh, there are just in terms of the question about explaining LIHEAP, there are two components to LIHEAP. One is for people who qualify, they get a uh, assistance in paying their monthly uh, energy bill during the heating season. And then there is the emergency assistance that people facing a crisis who don't have. Um, uh, that's the one that uh, uh, Sue referred to who, who uh, don't, you know, can't can't uh, pay their bill and are going to go cold or, or, or whatever. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mr. Zabriskie. Well, I'm available for questions. I have no prepared comments, but thank I'm, you very much. Stand um, by. So, uh, yes, uh, a quick question? Yeah, sure. It might not be a quick question, but I'll try. Okay. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony. Uh, with the existing state and federal programs right now, uh, how much more beneficial do you see S5 helping low to middle income people? Well, I think uh, as I tried to explain, you know, the reduction when we weatherized um, a, a home, which I think this is going to facilitate not just weatherization, but new efficiency investments in multiple homes. But the long term savings in terms of cost of reducing cost um, is incredible. In some cases, we've heard of families who the cost to heat their home has been cut in half after we leave a weatherization. So uh, that is long term. So I think the more that we can look at the home heating needs and of course transition to those that aren't reliant on um, uh, imported sources of energy that are moving towards uh, sustained uh, and locally generated sources, I think that transition has uh, the long-term uh, benefit of reducing cost and volatility uh, for the system as a whole. Uh, what I tried to point out is the degree to which right now so many Vermonters, uh, because of the costs and volatility of our existing energy sources, are really uh, challenged. And we are working to meet that challenge, but we're also trying to reduce their costs long term. So I think in the long term, there's no question uh, that we will see benefit to the households we serve. Thank you. If I may, I may add one more. Uh, with with the current, and I've, I've asked this on a number of witnesses, the current workforce, and I know weatherization is flat out. I mean, there's they could work seven days a week, uh, but with the existing workforce, where do you foresee bringing in another four thousand people to to meet our goals? I would love Paul to share uh, his experience. I think these are very real challenges. Yeah, undoubtedly. Um, I, I just would point on uh, your first question. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill, the federal resources that are uh, still the details of those, those the rules associated with those are, are not entirely clear. But they're primarily built on incentives, on rebates, and on tax credits. And all of those assume that a consumer has the upfront 
resources to, in, to make an install to, in order to access those resources. So I think that uh, S5 contemplates mechanisms that provide resources for low-income Vermonters that are not necessarily addressed in the other uh, resources that uh, are likely to be forthcoming uh, for the rest of the market segments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for joining us this morning, <coughs> Sue. Yeah. Yes. Oh, uh, Representative Sevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Paul, I'm wondering, and maybe it's Sue, I don't, I'm guessing it's Paul, could you um, just share a little bit? You and I have chatted about the energy coach. And could you share a little bit about that? Because one of the things we've talked about in this committee is that it can be a, a potentially confusing, meandering path to understand how to do, like what steps to do in upgrading your home and how to go about it. So could we move this since Paul can stay with us yes. um, and Maura's on a time schedule? Could we yes. take Maura's testimony, Maura okay. Collins' testimony? Okay, and then come back to this question. And Paul, you are able to stay with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Sue. Um, thank you. Thank you. Maura, if you're able to join us. I am. Thank you. And I'm over here trying to answer your questions before you have to ask them again. Hi, I'm Maura Collins. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Housing Finance Agency. I'm so grateful to be here with you today. I have testified in this committee in prior um, uh, sessions, but not often. And so um, I'm excited to be here. I'm not often here because VHFA is a statewide affordable housing lender. So I'm usually down the hall to the right. And we're usually talking about banking issues and housing affordability and low and moderate income needs for Vermonters because we run a statewide affordable mortgage program, usually for first time home buyers. Um, and that's what we were started to do was to meet the market need to offer lower interest rates to buyers who are purchasing a home who are income eligible for our programs. And then we have several programs that to support the creation of affordable rental housing. We administer um, federal tax credits, which is the largest source of money to create affordable rental housing. We have a state tax credit program and we do loans to that. We don't come here for state appropriations. We're completely self-sustaining and we do that by selling tax exempt bonds and that will really put you all to sleep. So I'm gonna move on, but um, I'd be happy to talk about any of that if we haven't met already. Um, I, why I'm here and, and how I got into this work is because VHFA has long been very focused on getting people into housing and focused on the affordability of getting into housing. And then through those loans that we offer, um, making that housing affordable. And on and off, we have um, participated in various ways to support the ongoing affordability of housing through lowering utility costs. And so we've had many programs over the years where we've looked at mortgage programs that can be adjusted for um, uh, energy usage of a home. But it was in 2020 that we got involved with um, an Energy Action Network working group working to bring weatherization to scale. We know we need to weatherize 120,000 homes in the state. We know we've done about 30,000 so far, and the program Sue was mentioning um, continues to chip away at that need. But we also know that we aren't going to get to 120,000 homes through straight appropriations and um, with the course that we have right now. And so you may remember a few years ago, you all put some um, funding into a weatherization repayment assistance program, RAP is the acronym, so weatherization repayment assistance program, and folks earning up to 120% of median can get there if they do an energy audit and they need work done on their home, we can um, weatherize their home and pay for that upfront. And then the household owner or renter can pay that back over time through their utility bill. This is a partnership we're doing with four distribution utilities, electric companies and Vermont Gas um, already. And that is just starting to really get up and running and roll out now. We're partnering with Efficiency Vermont and Vermont Gas and Burlington Electric as the three energy efficiency utilities in the state to administer that. I mentioned that background 
because I want to put strong support behind this bill because I have been working for many years and VHFA has um, a long track record to look at how to make housing more affordable long term. And I think that this bill is going to do it for all the reasons that you just heard of from Sue that we know that price volatility and what's happened just over the past year, but we can look back many, many years and know that inaction is not going to make you um, electricity or heating costs, thermal costs, any more affordable. It is only going to keep people on this volatile um, roller coaster. And in VHFA's experience, and I think many who work with lower income households, we all know that the budget plan works. You don't even have to be lower income to know that smoothing out that volatility makes everything more affordable for folks because it's more predictable. And this S5, in large part, I'm trying to you know keep it short, is going to take folks off of that roller coaster and make it more stable. Um, I do also want to say that the transition from the current system that we have to this needed change is going to cost money. And I think we have to be honest about that. And we have to, there's a real risk that without firm targets to serve certain people and without guardrails to protect those folks, that the economic and environmental burden could continue to be put on lower income Vermonters. And so I want to talk about the ways I applaud this bill for building in those safeguards largely. I know that our state has a goal of ensuring equitable access to the benefits of energy efficiency, renewables and energy incentives. Uh, but where we sometimes fall short is in the implementation of that goal and so I'm going to get very specific in a minute and get right down into the details um, to, to speak to some ways that I think this bill already was changed to, um, uh, to protect lower income Vermonters and how it could do so even more. And so the few recommendations I'm going to make are in um, the, your committee's um, uh, uh, website. Sorry, I'm now pulling up Zoom because I want to share what um, uh, the memo I presented so that you can see the language that I'm talking about uh, as I do it. It's not a pretty PowerPoint. I apologize, but you have this memo on your um, committee's uh, website, and you will see that right now the definition of low income is those below 60% area median income, AMI in my language. And then moderate income is between 60 and 120% of area median income. The effect of that means that if you earn below the 60% of median, you don't qualify for those moderate income benefits. And I would recommend the language change so that moderate income is defined as earning below 120% of median income, but not putting a floor to it so that we can maybe help serve even more low-income households in that moderate income category. So keep the low-income definition as is, change the moderate income definition to remove the floor so that if I'm earning 55% of median, I could qualify as low or moderate income. I'm trying to imagine the implementation of this program. I'm trying to imagine um, the participants who would be setting up targets of, no, 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 now I got to serve some somewhat higher income folks in this moderate definition. I'm trying to make sure that they don't leave behind very low income folks. Um, I also, I applaud the Senate's work at defining low and moderate income. That was testimony that Kathy and I um, made loudly in the Senate side, and we were very uh, grateful for these definitions. And so that is wonderful. At the very end, as you know how this works, there was a little discussion about is area median income the right term, or should we go to statewide median income, the greater of the area or the statewide? And I'm asking for you to consider that conversation because you have a little more time with it than when we were talking about at the very last minute of the Senate. Because if you have a statewide income limit, 
it will make the implementation of the program easier. When you think about these um, delivery agents and all these participants, if there were some statewide income limits, it would make it easier than talking about, you know, in this county, it's this, and that county, it's that. Area median income limits are largely, are mostly by county, except for Northwestern Vermont, which is a three county area of Chittenden, Franklin and Grand Isle all has one income limit. So every time it's a head scratcher about why Richford has the same income limit as Winooski mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. South Burlington, but that's the way the numbers work. And I wanna make sure you all know that so that you know what you're asking when you look at this. So a statewide number might over serve, might have kind of higher numbers for some communities and too low a numbers for other communities. If anything, working with the data, I think it's going to mean that the incomes of our Northeast Kingdom and our higher poverty areas that have more efficient housing might be a little higher than um, uh, what is warranted based on their area calculation. And the Chittenden County and areas where we actually have a little more um, recently built housing might be a little low, if you can imagine how that smooths out statewide. Representative Sebelia has a question. Yeah. Uh, Maura, can you, who could help us um, really fine tune that? I would be happy to. Great. Um, there is, oh, I wanted to jump over. I'm hoping that um, I have it all queued up. Someone um, was just asking about um, the, oops. You're not seeing it. Okay. Um, about how many people. And I just want to say that we do have um, information about households by income group on this fancy housing data website. And um, you can see here, and I can show you where this is. This is housingdata.org. I went to um, uh, income and employment, and I was able to pull up how many households by different income group. I know that this isn't at 60%, but it starts to give you an idea. You could pull up every county or actually every town in the state to um, see what the income levels are for um, by that. And someone else asked about um, how many people are eligible under this program um, and there are some other numbers about, we're talking about 21% of owners would fall in that low income category and about <clears throat> half of our renters. And then you'd add another 27% of owners would fall in the moderate income category or 30% of our renters. So in total, 81% of our renters would fall into these two targeted areas that's been identified in S5, whereas 48% of the owners would fall into that targeted area to be addressed. And I'm happy to follow up um, with more details on this as well. So my final, I'm moving very quickly, um, pieces that I wanted to um, speak to next goes to um, a little bit of a um, disagreement among some of us uh, about what something says under D5. Um, the language talks about that uh, in determining whether um, the clean heat measures must be delivered to folks with low and moderate income, that it should take into account participation in other government sponsored low income and moderate income weatherization programs. I'm told that the intent of that language is to make sure that people who are already participating in programs like LIHEAP, like weatherization and all that are still eligible for clean heat credits. As someone who administers public funds, I am so aware of the uh, cardinal rule that you never allow double dipping and that you have to make sure that if you're eligible for one thing, you're not getting the same kind of benefits covered by another governmental program. And when I read this language, and this is the disagreement, I read this to actually make it sound like if you are participating in other low and moderate income efficiency programs, that maybe you shouldn't be eligible for clean heat credits. You may be, uh, you may not agree with me and you may think that this is clear as can be, and that's fine. To me, when I see in determining whether to exceed what we're gonna do for low income households, the commission should take into account participation in other government programs is not clear enough to say that the taking into account means it's okay to do it. And so at the very bottom of this paragraph I have on the screen, I'm gonna throw out a language change recommendation that 
participant participation in other government sponsored low and moderate income weatherization programs should not limit the availability of clean heat measures available to those households by nature of that participation. For your consideration, that's the goal of, I'm just trying to make sure it's very clear that if you're participating in some government um, programs already, it does not by that nature make you ineligible for this participation, which I know is everyone's goal. I just think that years from now, when we're doing other things, I wanna make sure that's clear. Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, Maura, thank you so much. I What I've heard, um, about this particular topic is that uh, the participation of low and moderate income folks in other um, government programs like weatherization programs, for example, um, and, and counting those as, as clean heat measures makes this more affordable to implement. Um, so are you suggesting that I'm not exactly sure what the upshot of, of this comment is here. Yep, uh, I agree with that. And I'm hoping that um, S5 and, and these measures are going to mean that there may be more resources and support for RAP that I spoke about, for the um, weatherization assistance program that Sue spoke about, which serves households at 80% um, or below. And RAP, I didn't say this before, actually goes right above that for 80 to 120 and trying to serve that next year and other um, programs. And so I agree that clean heat it should hopefully be trying to make all of this more affordable. I want, again, there's something about it I'm just not understanding when I read this language as is, I'm um, worried that someone could see it as a division of um, that there are clean heat measures that we're going to do. And then there's weatherization that someone could participate in and that someone couldn't participate in both. So again, I, I this is I'm told that I'm in the minority here. Um, so I am high, fine with moving on, but I just wanted to make sure that the lawyers or everyone else is meeting the legislative intent, which I think everyone agrees with, which is that participating in weatherization and participating in these clean heat measures would be the same. Representative Smith. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, VHFA carries mortgages for low-income families. <clears throat> low-income families see the need for replacement of a heating system or heat pumps or furnaces or anything. Uh, will VHFA consider or do they refinance and remortgage to include these heating systems? Because I know there will be assistance for them, but maybe not enough to really actually make it happen. Mm -hmm. You will you will remortgage. Sorry, no, I was listening, so I was nodding. Uh, we do not offer refinances right now. the The tax exempt bonds that I skipped over do not currently allow us to offer um, refinancing. There is a bill in Congress if you want to have that conversation um, to allow us to do that. But right now, we don't offer refinancing. That same bill. Uh, right now caps us that if we want to give a loan to a home renovation project, we could, but we're capped at $15,000. I think we all know that that doesn't get us as far as it used to. So that same bill is going to raise that to $50,000 and keep up with inflation. I was in DC last week advocating for that bill. So I, um, I have interest in exploring that in um, partnership with um, regular banking partners like we always do but that is not something that we offer right now because of the limitations on our source of money. Well, I know you've helped a lot of people in the Northeast Kingdom and uh, you're, you're appreciated for that. So. Thank you. The last um, recommendation that I wanted to make was that um, later in the bill, there's a review of consequences study um, that's gonna be looked at biennially. And um, it talks about the consequences that may happen to deforestation, conservation of grasslands, damage to watersheds and the like, very focused on the environmental consequences. And we would suggest that that review also be broadened to consider the unequal impact on low income or disadvantaged groups. I will acknowledge that later, um, or actually earlier in the bill, there is talk about looking and trying to get at equitable distribution of clean heat measures. And I applaud that. That's like, are we distributing the, the resources equally 
among these groups. But I think that understanding the unintended negative consequences that may come also is an important step. That is the uh, foundation of energy justice is to look at not only who's benefiting from something, but who may be unintentionally harmed by it. And so including the look of the review of consequences to include people and what their experience was um, would be important. And the last question I have for the committee, and I don't know how to fix this one, so I'm sorry, I don't have language to tell you how to fix it, is when looking at rental buildings, we applaud the Senate that they included under the um, default delivery <coughs> agent to focus on rental housing and that rental housing is throughout this bill. There is, we all know, the split incentive there about investing in rental housing. And so as written, when you're talking about low and moderate income targets, if a property owner who um, manages or owns uh, you know, a landlord who owns property, if they do not personally qualify as low and moderate income, but they want to invest in a property that is very clearly um, lived in by low and moderate income folks. And I'm gonna to turn to you know, then your next witness to be an example of this. Ever North may not qualify as low or moderate income as a corporation, but their tenants absolutely are all under 60% of very AMI. Is it clear or does it need to be defined how that's going to work? Because again, when you're a homeowner, it's clearer. I do income certifications all the time. It's clear to know what your income is and you're an owner. But in a rental situation, I want to make sure that it's not the property owner who's assessed, but it is the renters. Representative Logan. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that point. Um, and I imagine that Cassie or Paul could speak to, and Damian Leonard <laughs> could speak to how this is done for weatherization programs and other programs like lead based paint um, remediation, because that's certainly how it's done in those um, programs. I am so grateful to be here. There is so much good work that has been done already to this bill. Um, that we talked about defining the income areas, the front loading of credits was something that we had really advocated for. Um, and we appreciate the way that the default delivery agent is focused on um, rental housing and adding how inefficient manufactured housing can be replaced by more high efficient manufactured housing as an eligible measure. Um, VHFA was added to the equity advisory group, which I think is very beneficial to have a lower income housing um, uh, organization at that table. Um, I may have already seen a copy of what Kathy's about to say, and I just want to say I also endorse what I heard from Sue and what I think you're going to hear from Kathy. And so when I walk out the door to my next meeting, it's not because I'm in a fit. It's because I just have some risk. So I think you should probably know that we did take out the equity advisory group. Okay. Because the Office of Racial Equity asked us to reconfigure how that was addressed, and we've done that with the latest draft. Yep. Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, does, VHFA, uh, does VHFA serve on the Environmental Justice Advisory? No. Okay. If Kathy can tell you about a little group she's pulled together that's looking at environmental justice and housing, uh, but that's probably another topic for another day. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next up, I think we have Kathy Fire. Welcome Thanks so much. See if I can get this working. The screen share. Yep. Hold on. I need a technical assistance. Green. Okay. There we go. Yes. Good morning. I'm um, Kathy Byer. I'm senior vice president for real estate development of Evernorth. And uh, Evernorth has only been around a couple of years. We, um, in 2020, merged with a sister nonprofit based out of Portland, Maine, 
and we now cover the three northern New England states of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. But our real estate development activities are completely focused in Vermont, and my work as a nonprofit real estate developer is completely focused in Vermont. Um, in our history, uh, over 35 years, um, we have been leaders in energy efficiency and the renewable fields. We have um, in our statewide portfolio, portfolio, we have hundreds of units benefiting from uh, solar hot water, solar PV, advanced wood heating systems, um, and uh, we have one geothermal, one beautiful building on geothermal, and most recently heat pumps. Um, we work across the state with our regional nonprofit partners, and many of you may know some like Champlain Housing Trust based in Chittenden County or um, Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust based down in the southern part of the state. But we, wherever we work, we work in partnership with our regional nonprofits, the Rural Edge in the Northeast Kingdom. So <clears throat> know that low-income Vermonters um, just have a disproportionate energy burden, right? This is from Energy Action Network. The um, lower income Vermonters have an energy burden that is three times higher than median income Vermonters. Interestingly, it's the higher income Vermonters who actually use twice as much energy. So, you know, their, their energy burden is lower, right? Because they have more income, but they are also using considerable, their, their, impact of greenhouse gas um, emissions is, is twice that of our lower income households. Um, as noted in the state's comprehensive energy plan that was updated in 2022, the burdens and benefits of energy policy in Vermont have not been equally distributed across the state or its citizens. And there's a fantastic section in the um, clean energy plan on energy equity, and I know you don't have time to read more than um, you have in front of you, but it is. Um, I, it was. It, I was very pleased to see that the state's comprehensive energy plan, um, for the first time, I think, really called out energy equity as a need. Um, and I think the affordable housing, uh, the Affordable Heat Act, does address equity, and and that is is. Um, the, the, the S5, as written, is trying to get at that need for the balance, right? Like, we know that we need to find the balance before, between our greenhouse gas reduction goals and the impact on low and moderate income Vermonters that Maura talked about, that Sue Minter talked about. And that's really the question for you in S5 is like, have we achieved that? Is this the balance? Um, and I think as S5 originally was written, that balance question was going to be determined by the PUC, which I do not think was the right place for it. And I'm very um, applaud the, the amended version where we have now defined low income as below 60% of median and um, moderate as below 120% of median. And I, and I agree with uh, Morris points on perhaps how we look at those two buckets. Um, I want to be clear that the Affordable Housing Network recognizes the importance to decarbonize our housing stock, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of our low-income households who may be left at the back of the line. That's you know what the balance is about is um, the people who may be the last to participate in this transition. In this transition. So when we think about housing, we think about the two types: ownership and rental. And um, what we find is that um, heat pump adoption has been much more prevalent in single family homes. That's just the really due to the nature of the building, right? It is just easier to put a heat pump on a single family home <laughs> um, as opposed to um, some of you may be familiar with this building in downtown Montpelier. Ever North and Downstreet Housing and Community Development partnered with the city of Montpelier to build Taylor Street and 30 apartments. We planned from the beginning to use heat pumps. So you know, through the new construction, we could plan for how we're going to run those refrigerant lines up through the building. There was absolutely no, addi no additional land space to um, put the condensers. And um, 
And then we were able to plan for putting the condensers on the roof. We were able to get solar panels on the roof, but this is all in a new construction um, scenario. Um, so I got a little off track. Let's single back, let's, uh, circle back to the um, single family homes. Um, I, as as uh, Sue Minter pointed out and Maura pointed out in the single family home <coughs> category, and I think Representative Stebbins was getting there, <laughs> there is a category of that housing stock that um, we all know, right? It was, it's old. Um, it needs more than just a heat pump, right? The thermal shell is so bad that a heat pump wouldn't be able to keep up with it. And that is um, uh, witnessed by, you know, this, this slide always amazes me is the percent of our housing stock that's older that was built after uh, or before 1970. Uh, so Maura's point about making sure that you can use, um, you can access the other uh, programs like weatherization with the, with the um, clean heat measures is very important because these homes are going to need um, significant investment to get there. So, um, we also more also brought up that um, I think it was, I really applaud the, the addition to include replacement of manufactured housing with high efficiency um, homes. I, you know, I drive, I live in Hinesburg. I drive past this mobile home park, I won't name names, and it has some of the oldest mobile homes, and it just are uh, an energy disaster, and I know for the people who are living there, um, there's not much we can do to, <laughs> to make those homes better. So I want to switch back to um, the renter category, and more brought up the term split incentive. Does everybody know what that means? So the, the um, landlord does not pay the utilities, the renter pays the utilities. So there's a, there's a split incentive. There's no, the landlord has little incentive to improve the energy efficiency of the building because the tenant just pays higher, um, higher utility bills. And um, a, S5 does nothing to address the split incentive. The renters who are paying their own heat, I, in my viewpoint, are largely left behind. Um, and that, it's not really a fault of S5. There's not a, a mechanism to address this. Um, or maybe perhaps we could look at, is there a way to incentivize more landlords who, who are not paying for heat um, to make that switch? But that is a category right now that is at risk because we know that um, the price of uh, fossil fuels is going to go up as a result of implementation of this bill. One help is is you know more money for LIHEAP to help these renters, um, but at, that is a category that I, of all the categories, I think that is probably um, most at risk. However, there are landlords who do um, pay for the heat in, in, in the affordable housing industry across the state. Most are 95% of our buildings, uh, we as the owner of the buildings pay for the heat and we do that for a couple of reasons. One is obviously the economic security of our residents um, and that they are not going through those fluctuations. The other is we that then that then puts us, the owner of the building, um, very um, <clears throat> focused on the energy efficiency of the building, right? Because we're paying the heating bill and the electric bill. And so we um, look for every way that we can to keep those utility costs down, which is good for um, also good for greenhouse gas reduction. I do want to talk about buildings where um, converting off fossil fuels will just be a physical challenge. So this is um, in Windsor um, called uh, Armory Square, Union Square in Windsor. It's 42 apartments. This building um, is obviously a historic building, and um, it uh, is currently on uh, fuel, uh, um, you know, hydronic baseboard heat. So to convert this to heat pumps um, will be challenging, right? Because we got to get those refrigerant lines through the buildings. We got to make sure that the thermal shell is out of that. The heat pumps are going to be able to keep up uh, the, with the thermal shell. We got to find a place to put the condensers. Um, I I think 
this is one building where I, I'm not sure that adding heat pumps is actually going to be possible, but um, we have already done, it's a little blurry. Um, we've already done um, a feasibility study on installing advanced wood heat. So I think it's very important to keep advanced wood heat as a, um, a, a measure, an eligible um, measure in the bill. And I just wanted to point out that that's one of the reasons um, that I would say that. So my um, intention is not to spell all doom and gloom about the AHA. I just, I just wanted to talk about this, um, this balance to address climate change, decarbonize our housing stock, and really talk about um, also the equity impact on our low and moderate income Vermonters. And I, I also would, um, uh, I didn't have specific language, but I would say, while the bill talks about equity, there is more than more than just the example Maura gave, where then the bill um, it it for example sets up the tag, the technical assistance advisory group, but that group has no link to the um, equity uh, working group. So that those that when the the tag is making an assessment, that that assessment includes or coordinates with the work of the equity advisory group. So that is really the core of what we're trying to get at is that every time we talk about greenhouse gas reduction, the climate impact at the same time, we're talking about impact on low and moderate income Vermonters. I will end there if you have any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Do members have questions? Representative Bonger. Can you? Sputter you a little bit, but do you have, I know you don't have language, but you have suggestions about how we could deal with the issue of um, landlords who don't, don't pay? Split incentive? Yeah, split incentive. Oh, people, we've been trying to, like, people have been trying to fix that for years. Uh, I, 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 I don't, other than, um, I'll, I'll try to think about more is there a way you can't mandate it you know you can't tell every landlord switch over and you got to start paying for the heat heat for the building but are there things we could do that would make it more likely they would choose that um so i'll think about that a bit more choose weatherization and upgrade yeah. systems yeah yeah some will i mean some will out of the you know good idea or you know they but some won't. We know that. Uh, Representative Pat. Uh, I'm just a little confusion in my head, and maybe I'm misunderstanding something, but both uh, you and Maura had mentioned uh, the desire to uh, have um, measures that are that are paid that are currently available to be paid for by existing public funds. Uh, included in this, but the, um, the structure of this in terms of the credits are the obligated parties are the companies that are uh, bringing fossil fuels in, into the state. And, and, and it's the, the, uh, the bill is attempting to put responsibility on, on them. So I, I, I definitely understand the desire to have programs working together if they're doing similar things but um uh if 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 there's a uh, an obligation on the part of an obligated party uh that's an obligation on them not on the low-income weatherization program so that that's my uh, what i started wondering about yeah it's complex yeah um uh but i i think what we we want to make sure that if we can figure out the complexity, that the language doesn't say, oh, well, you can't double dip. You know, you get weatherization money so that you can also get heat measures. Yeah, I, I would think that the, it, let's say there was a project in which both the low income weatherization program and uh, uh, other measures uh, uh, or, or additional measures being uh, that are being uh, put in in one way or another through the uh, obligated party that they would get credit for mm -hmm. their part of it, but yeah. not the publicly funded part. Yeah. I do want to um, 
I want to resonate that I uh, I hope that the language is clear around um, I, this is very self serving but um, in our uh, portfolio our renters seventy percent of our renters earn below fifty uh, percent of median so I would hope that owners of buildings who house low and moderate income households would be eligible as as I think that's the intent but. I'm sure the language quite gets there. Seventy percent. What did? What was the number you just said? What was the number you just said? Seventy uh, percent would be under fifty. No, but <laughs> recommendation in the bill. I, you know, I, I'm sorry. I need to go back and look at the at the language to see how um, how to clarify that. Oh, okay. I apologize. I can I can send something to the committee. Yeah, um, Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, I continue. I'm. You and Mora have said a similar thing. Um, you know regarding. Um, you know, making sure that low and moderate income households are eligible for additional clean heat measures. Um, I just want to be clear that I'm understanding the policy as it as it's written currently. Um, one of the, the reasons that um, prioritization of low and moderate income households right now is particularly possible is because of all of the federal money that we have available to us to perform this kind of work in low and moderate um, income households. And that performance of that work um, by say, like the default delivery agent, for example, would um, would retire clean heat credits. So it's money that's already being allocated for those purposes and will help reduce emissions and therefore counts as a clean heat measure. Um, and the fact that that money is, so to speak, already in the bank and being spent means the overall compliance with the clean heat standard will be more affordable. Um, so I just want to be clear that that's really the case, that money spent on weatherization programs that are already existent and will increase in their funding level because of new federal dollars will count as clean heat measures. Yes? Starting this year. Starting this year. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks so much. Members, let's take a five-minute break. Um, we're going to continue our testimony on S5 and welcome uh, Craig Bolio, the Commissioner of the Department of Taxes. Welcome, Commissioner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, for the record, Craig Bolio, Tax Commissioner. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to weigh in on this. As the tax guy, I don't get over to this committee very often. And my discussion today is going to be fairly limited in the scope of the bill and really focused on the provisions related to the fuel tax and confidentiality of tax records. I'm working from the draft that I believe was posted yesterday, draft 1.1. Um, from yesterday at 11, 14 a.m. So my, to get to my, my headline, my overall ask of the committee is a simple one. Um, I would ask the committee to remove the provisions from this bill that compel the department to change the fuel tax form uh, to include wholesale data and remove the provisions that change the confidentiality of those tax records. I do not believe that it adds value to what the committee is trying to achieve. So under current law, the fuel tax is paid by uh, retail sellers of uh, heating oil, propane, kerosene, natural gas, coal, uh, other dyed diesel, right? And there's a per gallon uh, tax on the heating oil, propane, kerosene, and other dyed diesel, and then natural gas, coal, and electricity has a percentage-based tax on it. Uh, the key fact here is that our relationship is with the retailers, right? Not the wholesalers. Um, and information about the wholesalers does not impact the tax calculation or tax administration, right? And additionally, by, <clears throat> excuse me, by statute, all tax information uh, by default without an exception in law is confidential, right? And so, uh, this bill has a few big changes that impact my little corner of the world. The first is that on page nine, line uh, seven, 
uh, my department uh, is, is required to begin sharing all of the fuel tax data forms with uh, the Public Utility Commission, and they will uh, publish those documents publicly. So that's a big change in tax administration, right? We don't have uh, much tax data that becomes public. Uh, it also has later on that page and starting on page 10, the requirement to uh, change the fuel tax data that, again, among other things, starts to capture information about the wholesalers or where the retailer, who the retailer purchased from. Any time that we're going to make changes to tax confidentiality, I ask that we be very thoughtful about it and, and think about the balance of the cost and benefit for that. And in this case, it's hard for me to find the value in, in what that change will do. Firstly, my read of the bill is that the PUC is going to have all of the regulatory authority that it would need to get this data directly from the companies. Um, on line eight, or sorry, page eight, line 10, it talks about the annual registration uh, with the PUC, and it talks about the authority that they can set what is required and that that required information shall include the types of heating fuel sold and the volume of the sales of those fuels. So that data is already going to be going to the PUC. Additionally, the bill lays out on page 13, I believe, uh, the enforcement provisions that uh, the PUC gets the authority to enforce the requirements of the chapter. They can order penalties and injunctive relief. Uh, and I think on page 14, it says that failure to file is a violation of the Consumer Protection Act. So it's unclear to me what additional teeth uh, folks believe my department has. Like, we don't license these companies. Uh, I believe more regulatory authority is going to be provided to PUC than to us. So the idea that we would have uh, more honest data is, is uh, interesting to me on that front. Um, and again, we don't get the wholesale data today, nor will it impact the tax calculation or tax administration. So it is likely that the quality of the data that we would be sending over to the PUC would be no better than what they would get themselves, unless I were to redirect resources from tax administration and from compliance activities that would have an impact on tax uh, 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 liabilities owed from Vermont taxpayers to validating that data. Which again, I would say, instead of having the communication channel be business to tax to PUC and PUC to tax to business, just keep it at business to PUC. Uh, we, we are not adding any value because the quality of our data will be no better. Um, so again, my, my headline is that I ask the committee to remove those provisions. Uh, I think that this would set a bad precedent for uh, making tax records less confidential. Um, and I think it would do so with uh, little to no value added to what you folks are trying to achieve. Thanks for having me. Happy to take Can questions. you um, provide those in writing for us so we make sure? Sure. Capture them. Thank you. Sure. Representative Sebelia. Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. The, um, the, so the data, mm -hmm. uh, your concern is about the tax department sharing it, not about it being shared. Uh, either way, it's being shared at the PUC. Is that correct? Sorry, uh, can, you, can you just clarify the question a little bit? You, uh, my concern is more of tax data becoming public. So it will become public. At the P, so, but your request is for you not to collect it, for the PUC to collect. Correct. And so it's going to become public either way. Right, but not through the method of it being tax data that then gets published publicly. Thank you. And again, I'm not sure that the data that the PUC needs is going to align exactly with what is on our tax form either, right? So there might be some uh, irrelevant data that ends up published publicly there. Uh, I haven't thought every element of that through, but um, I do worry about that. Is there tax data today that is public? It's very limited. Um, the, there's a limited amount of landlord certificate data that gets, uh, it's not published, but it's available publicly upon request. Um, 
You, we also have, uh, we publicly disclose, uh, again, on request, not published, but um, who is licensed for sales tax, meals and rooms tax, or withholding, and if they're in good standing. Um, a lot of property tax data is public, but that's not really my department uh, that's overseeing that. Um, what is landlord certified? Certificate data. Yeah, so that is um, part of our renter credit program. So a program for uh, low and moderate uh, Vermonters who uh, could qualify for some help with their rent. Um, there's a landlord certificate that goes with that that uh, validates the uh, tenant uh, landlord relationship. So the rent that's being paid. Uh, it it actually doesn't. It used to say the actual amount of rent being paid. It no longer does unless that tenant is receiving a subsidy on their rent. And most are not. So most of those landlord certificates today just say the name of the tenant. Um, and actually, that, that's not part of the public data. I believe what's public is name of the landlord, address of the unit, number of units. I have to look it up in statute. But it's mostly the landlord data that is public from that. I, I, frankly, I'm, I was not thrilled when that happened either. Um, but it, it happened. Uh, and so that somewhere includes their income too no there's no there's no income data on that it's just if you gave me a moment i'd be happy to look it up and read exactly what it is but it's mostly demographic data it's that there's no income data that's published on that members uh, representative pat thank you um did, did you have the opportunity to discuss your concerns when this was when the senate committee was dealing with it or did you just did it have, sort of happen did you become aware of it uh, after afterwards or just curious whether there was discussion about this specifically? So this this language specifically was not in the bill when I testified in the Senate. I did okay. testify generally about concerns about use of tax data, okay. but at the time it was not clear to me um, that it would be wholesaler data that we don't even collect today. Right. So like this is now compelling us to collect new data that adds no value for us. Um, and then disclose all of it publicly. Mm -hmm. Representative Sedelia. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I'll look at this language again, but it's obligated parties can be retailers uh, or wholesalers. So it's not just collecting wholesaler data, it's right. the obligated parties data, I believe. Sure. I mean, again, I, I think that the PC is giving all the regulatory authority that they need to collect that data and enforce those provisions. Yeah. So you you collect data from anyone that sells fuel oil in Yeah, Vermont. deliveries into Vermont, the retailers. Yes. So any obligated party is going to be having to report fuels to you? Uh, not if they're strictly a wholesaler, but um, yeah, if, only if they have retail deliveries into Vermont. Okay. Further questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thanks for having me. And I'll, I'll uh, submit the uh, comments written as well. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Okay, next up, we have Kyle Landis from the PUC. Together. Yeah, Welcome. Yeah. Good morning. For the record, Kyle Landis Marinello, General Counsel at the Public Utility Commission. And my name is Tom Nauer. I'm the Policy Director with the Commission. And we didn't prepare additional remarks, uh, but we're happy to respond to any questions that the committee has. We can also speak to what was just address now about the tax provisions. So we do have a different view on that issue. Yeah, I think that would be a great place to start. Thank you. Sure. Um, so uh, it, Commissioner Volio is correct that we do not need that data from the tax department if all of the obligated parties do what they're required to do under the statute and the rules that would follow. Um, however, I've learned from uh, spending uh, a number of years in enforcement at the Attorney General's office that 
good policy doesn't plan on the best case scenario. It plans on uh, worst case scenarios. And here, as we mentioned last week, there is one entity, one obligated party that we currently regulate, uh, Vermont Gas Systems. All of the other entities we currently have no relationship with. Um, the tax department does. They get, I believe the testimony in the Senate was around 200 of these forms a year. And um, so all of those uh, retailers, unless they're purchasing um, only in state, only from in state wholesalers, all of those retailers will need to register with us. And then the wholesale entities in Vermont are going to need to register with us. Uh, but how many of them actually do is an unknown. And um, uh, it's a big concern of ours at the commission for getting this program off the ground. We need as much compliance as possible. We're not going to get 100%, but for every single entity that doesn't do what it's supposed to do, the costs go up for all the ones who are playing <laughs> roles. And so this is where the information the tax department is already collecting can be tweaked to add some useful data points, breaking it down by fuels. Um, my understanding is the Fuel Dealers Association has supported that change for a while. Um, also adding information like where, the, where they bought it from at wholesale. And I, I agree with Commissioner Bolio that doesn't provide information the tax department needs, but it does provide very helpful information to the Public Utility Commission for getting this program going and really maximizing compliance. And so we do think those tax provisions are important for that standpoint. Um, in terms of it being public, where that comes from, it, a lot of it is how we do our business at the Public Utility Commission. Uh, we try to make everything public unless they're is a really good reason it can't be shared publicly. For instance, um, we do get some information, uh, critical energy infrastructure information. We've uh, the acronym CEII. We will protect that and keep it confidentially, but it's actually very difficult just within our system. Our electronic filing system doesn't allow us to have confidential documents in them, so we have to get them through a different method. And um, it causes constraints when we get uh, requests from members of the public and we expect a lot of public interest in this program and they're looking for data. And if we have data that we can't share publicly, um, that puts us in a difficult position. And so I agree with Commissioner Bolio. Generally, you don't want tax information to be made public, uh, but this is a very small set of entities. This is business data. It's not personal income data. Um, and this is information about fuels that the state of Vermont has said as a policy matter. We need to see how much of each of these fuels are coming in, and we need to know how much that's changing year to year uh, to address the Global Warming Solutions Act. And then this law should have become, uh, should it be this bill should it be passed into law. And so, um, just like nonprofit entities, their information may be made public. I believe the Senate heard testimony that transportation fuels, um, that information can be made publicly available. And so we think this would be helpful information um, for the commission to have for getting this program going and having high levels of compliance. Representative Sebelia. Thank you for your testimony. So, <clears throat> I want to make sure I understand um, what, where this data would be available. So um, as we have it written now, and I've gone back and read this, it seems to me that we would have the entities, like the names of the entities, publicly available on the website. We've said that on the bill. But it says it, it, it's less clear about the income data. It says it will be publicly available, um, which I heard Commissioner Bolio say uh, there are other data sets that are available upon public request. Uh, so will this, will the income data be um, out on the public or available on the website or available by request? It's a good question. And this, uh, this again goes to how we do business that um, 
be, uh, and we may be unique among state agencies in this way. Um, in 2017, we moved from paper <laughs> filing to electronic filing using the EPUC electronic filing system. And it, we make every single document that's filed with us in that system, every single order, our memorandum, anything that comes out from the commission, publicly available 24 seven through EPUC. Um, and the exceptions are these rare instances where we do have some confidential information. There are occasionally orders where part of the order has to be redacted. And there, the unredacted version is not available to the public, but the public is still on notice. This information is, is available um, at the PUC if people have the right to access that confidential information. So our policy um, uh, direction at the PUC, and this some of this comes from the legislature and uh, a big push by the legislature for more transparency, openness at the Public Utility Commission, we make all those documents publicly available 24 seven. And that's what we would wanna do with this information as well. Okay, and our legislation does uh, require that social security uh, information would not be publicly available. Right. You know, and, and so I will just say that um, I, you know, over the years of work that we've been doing this and engaging with the fuel dealers to make sure we have a good policy that is fair. Um, one of the things, one of the concerns that they have brought forward is just um, making sure we know who's, who's, who is in. And so this um, information feels really important to me for the fuel dealers themselves to be able to reassure themselves of who's in and who's out. So I think I'm satisfied with what we've got. But. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I, I also, uh, there's a, a broader concern about just tracking um, our, our performance and whether or not we're reaching our Global Warming Solutions Act requirements, um, uh, just in terms of are we actually collecting all the data we need? Um, and so I, I mean, I actually have a bill on the wall to try and address this issue because if we're not tracking the data we need, how do we know if we're even in the ballpark? Um, so this language for me is, is um, pretty critical that we keep it in. Um, I, I don't know what the point is, is of setting goals if we can't track it. Um, I, I will say though, if there is a concern specifically about confidentiality, um, perhaps the commissioner of the Department of Tax could provide us with additional like guardrails if, if there was a desire for that. Um, but I also know there, I mean, there are ways in PDF land to black out um, social security numbers and whatnot. So I, I guess, um, I guess I am very concerned if we uh, end up removing the, the data collection piece because it's, it's a key metric by which we measure our performance. Further thoughts or questions? Thank you. Oh, Representative Pat. I, I just, again, trying to get clear in my head the different entities, some of which may actually have the same information. And, and other, so, so you have um, uh, wholesalers who have a facility in Vermont and are selling to certain retailers. Um, uh, and both the retailer, the, the data of, of how many you know, gallons of, of which fuel would exist both at the wholesaler that is in Vermont um, uh, and making, making wholesale sales in Vermont as well as in the retailers they're selling to. But then you have the retailers who uh, travel to, into New Hampshire uh, in, in, and, and they're the importers. And we have no, we have no data from who they're buying from in New Hampshire because they're in New Hampshire. So the only data in that case would be um, uh, the, uh, the, the retailer who is, who is importing. I'm just trying to get uh, the uh, straight in my head where, the, where 
in in which businesses the data we're looking for exists. And that, so thank you for listening to me. I, unless I got it something wrong there. Representative Smith. You know, I guess I'm not fully up to this information, but I'm opposed to anybody nosing into somebody else's finances uh, other than the tax department. Uh, it's nobody's business what I make for, for a living or what anybody else makes for a living. And my social security card used to say not for identification purposes, but that's changed. Uh, that's just my opinion. Representative Logan. Thank you. That may be true, but you'll, I, if you were to participate in any one of these programs, um, you know, weatherization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, food stamps, um, aid, you name it, um, people are digging into your finances. And so having accurate data on the households that we're serving seems appropriate. And the most direct way to get the, tech, I would, the information would be from. from the I would agree with that. Uh, in instances where it's necessary for that information, but I don't think it's necessary in this instance. Yeah, Representative Simmons. So that's not what this data is. It's not the individual homeowner's data, um, just to be clear. It's uh, how much fuel is being <clears throat> sold um, and, and the quantity and the type. It's not the individual homeowner's data. So that's why it's important to actually track that because that's how you figure out if we're going up or down or where. Instead of Sebelia. Uh, for clarity's sake, I think just to bring us back to the data that we're asking to be reported is about the obligated parties. Uh, and uh, as Representative Logan has pointed out in other programs, uh, Vermonters have to provide qualifying income data as well. Representative Stevens. When we're ready to move on, we did two, two items from yesterday that we want to Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you. All right. Further questions on this? Uh, not seeing any. I do not. Thank you, Madam Chair. PUC. Oh, for the PUC? Yes, yes I do. Yes. Uh, so we had um, two questions. Well, I have two questions that I've noted. One is um, when we talk about appointing the CDA, I have to get to this place here. Um, how long uh, do you envision that process taking? Or how, how much time do you envision needing for that process? Uh, it, so we would need to develop kind of the, the RFP, issue it, uh, give potentially interested parties an opportunity to review the scope of work and develop their proposals, uh, submit them to the commission, and we would need to vet them and um, go through a contracting process. So at a minimum, I think half a year, um, but, you know, seems like the minimum amount of time we would want to do that. More time is always a year at least half a year. Half a year. Okay. And so uh, in uh, the bill, as we currently have it drafted, uh, and I believe this was a request from you all um, that the commission would designate the first default delivery agent on or before June 1st, 2024. I think we heard testimony from, I think, our ledge council wondering if that was maybe a little late, if we should have that earlier. So I can see you're thinking about that uh, in real time. I am thinking about that. <laughs> um, one thing that I, I continue to wonder about is, have we established a first compliance year yet? 
I, I think uh, Dave Westman from Efficiency Vermont was here last week talking about let's let's decide what's the first compliance year and work backwards from that. And I agree with uh, Dave's, Dave's point there. Um, Great. Rather than for, working from today forward, let's look at when we need to begin com complying and having that uh, delivery agent do that work. So uh, is it helpful for us to put a date in about um, when the PDA would um, be, when that process would start? Is there more? Well, I'm going to take that question back. Um, the other question I have is actually for the department, I think. No, it's not. I have a question. Uh, for the facilitator. I have one in this section. Okay. Um, I'm just curious where the 12 years came from in the PDA section, if I might. Right. So we, uh, when we were working on this language, we were trying to make it as analogous as possible uh, to uh, the existing law in section 209D, Title 30, that uh, it speaks about appointing an energy efficiency utility. Uh, so this is you know, the, the statute that governs the appointment of efficiency of Vermont. Um, that's just well known, uh, tried and true language and uh, because the commission is comfortable with how that process works, we are trying to borrow existing language rather than reinventing the wheel. And then a follow-up. Thank you. I thought you might say that. I just wanted to be sure of that. And um, follow-up for obligated parties who want to do their own work. How about that? So if you have a, you maybe we establish a timeline for the default delivery agent but I'm someone who I have my business and I want to be a delivery agent. How does that process work? How are you envisioning that working? And like the timing of it, I guess I'm just curious how long that takes in a business to get become a designated agent. So I, I, I'm going to ask uh, to clarify that. Are you saying an obligated entity wants to become one of the default delivery agents or the obligated party wants to do their own work. Their own work. Okay, right. Um, I think it's a, a multi-month process. Um, I'm, I'm using as an example uh, the, uh, the electric distribution utilities as well as Efficiency Vermont. We have a process where every year they develop their plan uh, in the efficiency world, it's you know what efficiency services are we going to offer in the next year. In the distribution utility world, it's what tier three services are we going to offer our customers in the next year. They develop that you know over the summer and they file then with the commission in November, so that we understand uh, what what they intend to do to meet their compliance obligations in the following year. I think uh, in this scenario, because we don't have existing relationships with uh, the obligated entities, and uh, because uh, I think th this most recent draft has the PUC actually approving that plan in advance, we would want to receive something, you know, in late summer, early fall period for us to review it um, and provide the obligated entity with some feedback or, you know, issue an order approving their plan so that they can mark it and. and uh, to their business as they wish. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I got it. I have another question. <laughs> <I'm trying. laughs> Sorry. Uh, I guess, is yours on this section? Just keep going. Okay. Um, I guess I'm curious if you have thoughts on or how you're seeing the um, potential study being linked up with the rulemaking process and making sure that there is a link. I think right now, uh, I'm not certain that there is a, a good, um, I don't think those are well coordinated right now. I, you know, the potential study has not been done. Uh, my understanding is that that, is, that takes a while to perform. And we'll be, you know, everyone who's, who's engaged in this will be doing their best, but we might not be working with the final potential study until late in our rulemaking process. Hmm. Your thoughts on helping us line that up? Uh, 
I, I can't, I believe the Department of Public Service has been tasked with doing that potential study. So I, I will not speak for them in terms of how long it takes for them to contact the center and get the work done. Uh, they would be in a better position to answer that question. Uh, but if, if we do want the potential study to uh, uh, be, you know, fully utilized by the commission in the rulemaking process, then we would need to uh, push the commission's deliverables out in time. Representative Stebbins is the next chance. Okay, Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, two questions. One is uh, there is um, some language in the bill currently that says if an uh, obligated party does not comply, um, they end up receiving four times. Um, you know, they have to pay four times the compliance credit payment fee. Um, we had some discussion about this yesterday, uh, and we heard from the fuel dealers that this seemed, um, you know, very. Uh, uh, Heavy handed, I don't think that was the exact word. Uh, and we also heard that originally in the Senate, it was three times. Um, we asked our ledge council about how this is done, like in the renewable energy standard. And I just wonder what your thoughts are in terms of this four times and whether or not there is precedent elsewhere that you've seen for that, whether or not you feel like that level four times is necessary? Is there something that would be more um, representative of how we <coughs> go about this work in other programs? Sure. In the Renewable Energy Standard, there is what's called an alternative compliance payment. Um, and so that, that's kind of the ceiling on what an obligated entity in the res, it is a distribution utility, it's a ceiling on what they would pay to comply. In practice, um, let's, I, I believe it started out at about $60 per megawatt hour. Uh, in practice, the utilities have been able to deliver uh, and comply for much less than $60 per megawatt on average. Um, and we've had very, very good compliance by the utilities. There was one instance where one utility, I won't name them right now, but they, you know, I think had a maybe a math error or a rounding error. And so they, their compliance in one year was one megawatt hour short of, of their obligation. And so they, they had to pay that alternative compliance payment. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a value that's known in advance um, by the obligated entities. Um, in terms of whether the four times is appropriate, you know, that's, that's something that we have not weighed in on. Um, it's, you know, maybe helpful to think about what is cost of not complying. And uh, in, in practice, if the entity doesn't comply in year one, we won't know about that until three quarters of the way through, or maybe two thirds of the way through year two. And then the actual greenhouse gas emission savings uh, would not occur until year three. So, uh, you know, I think having some um, non-compliance uh, is important to send a signal to the obligated entities that we, it's, it's important to comply now rather than have us comply later at a greater cost. And I'll just add in the legal world, um, I think the concept of, I don't know why they call it treble damages, I think of it as triple damages, but that is a very um, common penalty to put in when the government wants to really incentivize someone to comply. And part of where that comes from is that um, you look at a, a business entity isn't just looking at which avenue is cheaper complying uh, or not complying. There, They might also be taking into account what are the chances of being caught if I don't comply. And so some economic uh, economy, uh, economists will say, if you have four times uh, the damages, then uh, if someone's looking at, is there a 25% chance I'm going to get caught? And if there is, then they're likely to comply. If they see it as 20% chance I'll get caught, then they might not. And so the, the bigger the 
X is, the four times uh, means you're more likely to have compliance. Um, but the legal concept that's used a lot more is triple damages. And so I think that's why it was originally in there as that. Um, Thank you. And um, the other thing we were talking about yesterday was, uh, so last time you were in, you had requested um, some language uh, to clarify that um, although there is a legislative approval required at the end of the rulemaking process, um, that in order to do the work that you need to do, uh, you might need to issue some orders. So yesterday we were talking about what is the line, um, you know, how do we make it clear that you should be able to issue the orders you need to and do the work you need to while still um, being clear that it comes back for legislative approval. So there was some discussion with our legislative council about what type of orders, um, because it, it seemed like this committee was discussing a little bit about um, where that line is, um, how much you do, understanding that it's to create the structure, but then it still needs to come back to us. So wondering if you could, I don't know if you saw the language that our legislative council presided yesterday, but Actually, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the page that I saw from yesterday, it was page 33, but you have page 20, but from yesterday's. Yeah, I think the, the changes in draft 1.1 are, are very helpful in terms of um, making clear that we would still be able to issue orders. We'd still uh, have authority over these new entities. So that's... Um, <clears throat> As the bill passed out of the Senate, the way it's drafted now, um, I, we, it, well, before 1.1, the, the version that came out of the Senate, we did have a concern that um, saying aside Vermont Gas, which we currently have jurisdiction over, all these other entities, we have zero authority over right now. Um, they're not entities that we regulate. And so the authority for regulating those entities for asking them to register with us, for following up uh, if they fail to register with us. Um, any uh, proceedings we want to do, if we want some of these entities to talk to us about what they do, where do they bring the fuel, where do they send it, um, we currently have zero authority to do that. And under the bill as it passed out of the Senate, that could be interpreted as maintaining zero authority over the entities. Uh, uh, until there is uh, a specific legislative authorization two years from now that would make clear that this program's going forward. Um, so, yeah, I think that with the edits in there now in 1.1, 1 .1, um, that does go a long ways to addressing that. I think it would make clear that we do have the <laughs> authority now to issue orders to um, follow up on parties that don't register with us to even issue penalties in the meanwhile, if they fail to register or the attorney general's office can go to court and get those penalties. But it's important to have these changes in there. So those entities can not not uh, decide not to comply and then just present the defense that there's no authority to for anyone to make me comply. I think that, um, Maybe one of the, maybe another rep wants to chime in, but I, I think the concern was whether or not the language that was put into 1.1 was too broad and gave you too much um, authority, given the fact that this has to come back to the legislature for approval. I, uh, we definitely don't <laughs> think it's too broad. We think, yeah, and we'd be very concerned about trying to restrict that in any way. Again, I come back to these are. 100 plus new entities we don't currently regulate. This is the first in the nation program. There are a lot of things we're going to need to figure out to create the best program possible if we're given this task. And if there are restraints on what we can do to get that information, um, it, it's going to be a progress. These, and I'll just add to it, we're, I'm not trying to describe any bad motives or anything, but there's a big financial incentive that the obligated parties will have to uh, not provide all the information that we're going to be looking for to 
get this program going. And um, if you put restrictions on what we can do in this interim period, then I wouldn't be surprised if we start asking for stuff and their response is not to give it to us, but to say, you don't have authority to do that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Sebelia. And just coming back again <clears throat> to the testimony that we have heard uh, over the last you know, 18, 20 months or, and, and the work conversations that have been happening with the fuel dealers. Um, I know this issue of fairness has been uh, really, really important to them. And so, uh, you know, ensuring uh, that everyone has to comply um, as part of looking at this feels uh, pretty important in terms of the fairness factor for these folks who are, we are trying to encourage and support in transitioning. So I support this. So, um, I, uh, on a, in a different section, um, page 35, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the changes to the facilitator requirements. And um, in particular, so we took testimony from Office of Racial Equity that they are not looking for another group. And they asked that we could involve, um, address those concerns more directly through the public outreach process. Can you, uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. And then also in particular, on the very first line of page 35, we, it was a may that was changed to a shall. Sir, um, I think it's it, it's a policy choice that we do tend to prefer may over shell um, because I I do like I said I, I often go to what's the worst case scenario and you know third party consultants to do this type of public engagement are in very high demand now. Um, the last couple requests for proposals that we've put out for other things where people are in high demand, for instance, for court reporters, um, we had to issue it again a few months later because we got no bids when we did that. There's, and that's a worry I have with doing this type of work is just, I play out that worst case scenario. What if we don't get any bids or we don't get any qualified bids to be the consultant? I wouldn't want that to halt the whole thing in its tracks. And I wouldn't want to give someone who um, opposes this work a avenue into court to say the whole thing's invalid because they were told they shall hire a consultant and they never did it. And so um, I know there's another part of the bill, I'm not going to have it at my fingertips, where there is a very important sentence that makes clear that a procedural failure to follow some of these guidelines doesn't uh, impact the validity of the rest of what the commission does. Um, but I, I would lean towards more flexibility wherever it's possible. And, uh, and I'll also just add on that, that um, when something changes from a shell to a may, it's not like anyone at the Public Utility Commission says, oh, I guess we don't have to do that. Um, when there is legislative direction that this is what we're looking for, we take that incredibly seriously and we will do our best to meet all of those um, uh, uh, directions that are put in the statute and uh, particularly looking at equity issues, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is front and center at the commission and um, a lot of the work that we do and we are going to prioritize that if we're given this new work with the clean heat standard. Thank you for that. Um, Representative Tory. Um, I had a question about the edit in 1.1 to the bottom of page 21 on credit ownership. Um, I think I think it was there in terms of a question we had gotten from EDT about. Um, Divided. Is that something that you're that needs to be specific in here, or is that something that will be developed as you're further along? But there's just some logistical things that are hard to kind of like tier three, for example, with you 
Yeah, I think this was an edit. This was not one of ours. This was, right. I believe, Efficiency Vermont that put that in there. And um, I think it's a policy choice. I don't know, Tom, you may have some experience you can add to a similar type of provision. Um, the energy efficiency utilities, are they able to recover or something like that, those types of costs? Uh, so I, I agree, this is a policy choice uh, for, for this committee and other committees to, to make. Um, there are instances where distribution utilities and Efficiency Vermont will work together on joint projects and they work out the sharing, you know, the credit ownership slash sharing arrangement uh, without our intervention. Um, trust that that could work um, without any statutory guidance. Um, but if, if folks feel it's important to have, have it in this bill, then that's all right as well. And I'm sure, you know, I think this is, provides sufficient latitude for the technical advisory group to, you know, weigh in. <laughs> um, Representative Stevens, did you have one more? <laughs> okay, well, we, okay, great. Um, one continuing along that theme, so it's page 21 of 1.1. 1 .1, um, we had some discussion uh, about the concept of workforce development as part of the credit ownership. And there was some thought that perhaps that's in the wrong place, um, or at least I, basically the concept is it's recognized there will need to be some um, effort to. Uh, train the workforce? And is there any acknowledgement to how that may or may not um, be valued within a credit? I wonder if you have any thoughts on that or thoughts on this and this placement, or if and when this comes across the street and you're looking at it, will you just scratch your head and go, what? I have no comment on the placement uh, within the bill. Uh, I think it is clear enough, you know, if, if it were to go across the street that we would be able to interpret it that within the context of, you know, the technical advisory group will be sending a package over to the commission to review and approve. Um, and so I am confident that there would be enough documentation of, you know, they gave, you know, 1% of the credit to whoever provided that workforce development, you know, whatever the value is. Um, there would be sufficient documentation for that decision that we could interpret it. Thank you. Um, and then also uh, page 35, um, we had some discussion. <clears throat> there was a, a request by the Office of Racial Equity. Uh, it's not page 35. Um, uh, it is the list of types of measures, of which there are 11. And originally it was shall from the Senate and it became may. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I, I would assume you would prefer May because it's more flexible based off of what you just said. Yes, and we had, we did testify in the Senate that we prefer a May there rather than a shall. And, and part of the reason for that is if this program is given to us, it's not just for the next two, three, four, five years. This is expanding decades into the future. I mean, the Global Warming Solutions Act has a 2050 goal that um, uh, requirement that would need to be met. And so whenever you're looking out that far into the future, it does give us a little concern that having the shell in there and with some measures that aren't fully tested could create issues. And, and I also just look at it again, if someone were challenging this, um, uh, we could be in a difficult spot if the statute says it shall include the following. And um, one of those items that listed the tag does its analysis and says that's not actually going to reduce emissions. So we're giving zero credit to that. Um, an entity that uses that technology might bring a lawsuit and say, well, no, you were ordered to give credit to it. And um, we'd be in a difficult spot there. So I do always, that's another reason I look for that flexibility so that it prevents uh, that type of litigation. Yeah. Great. And my last question on this. Oh, okay. You should go because my question is different. So uh, on this, um, 
we noted yesterday that this list of eligible measures uh, has been compiled from a very broad uh, cross-section of stakeholders. And my question for you is, uh, if we make this a shall, how do we take something off the list? I, I, feel, I mean, we could pass a law, right? Is there um, anything, any other way we could take something off the list? I, if it's in the statutes, then it needs a, a law to change that. And so that's, yeah, a, a reason for the flexibility. And some of this, I think, is, um, I think there are some concerns that some stakeholders have that we might ignore uh, technology that should be qualified. I, I don't know where that skepticism or concern comes from, because certainly if we're being told they may include this, this is what we would start with. And there would have to be a really good reason for one of these things not to make it into the final rule as an approved measure. Um, and however it's drafted, because it's include, we can always add on to it. It's just how researched we are and um, uh, mandating that these ones be counted. And so in your initial recommendations, when we take this unprecedented step of coming back to the legislature for a check back, which we're doing, um, if we if there's a problem, uh, will that be uh, information that we'll be able to avail ourselves of before we um, vote? I don't know. And, and the reason is because something like green hydrogen, I don't think we're going to have much more information on that a year or two years from now than what we currently have. Um, so that's why I'm thinking more 10 years down the road, then we might know if that's something that worked out or there might be other impacts that no one's even thinking of now that uh, are a reason that policy-wise, no one wants to go forward with that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you said a, a moment ago that the potential study isn't um, linked all that clearly with rulemaking. Um, we've also had testimony that um, the Public Service Department is doing some public outreach regarding their next comprehensive energy plan. Um, we also just heard that VHFA would like to be part of the equity advisory group, but we got rid of the equity advisory group because another entity said, please don't keep asking everybody, you know, the same 50 people to show up to every meeting. My question is, would you please, as a lawyer, um, think about uh, some language that perhaps we could look at that would connect these dots and make it very clear to the PUC that we would like there to be small state um, coordination and recognition and tying in of the lessons that we're hearing and learning from other stakeholders? Yeah, yeah. And I, I also, I'm the PUC's appointee to the Interagency Committee on Environmental Justice. And so I was at the first meeting that they had. I'll continue to be at those meetings going forward. And, and like I said, that work is going to be front and center in uh, everything we do, including this new legislation, if it's given to us. So it sounds like you're looking for some specific language that would tie that and we can look to put something like that in. There are just so many efforts and I see them as complimentary and I think other people are seeing them as we should do one thing at a time and I'm hoping to make it complimentary. Hmm. Thank you. Anyway, on this follow up. Yeah, yeah. Representative Logan, that's good. Thank you. I'm um, just following up on that. Um, what we heard from ANR was that the Environmental Justice Council and the interagency panel um, already have too much work to do to take on, um, you know, oversight and advisement on the development of regulations for S5, which is why the equity advisory group was included in the bill. And then the Office of Racial Equity said, then that's, that's too much work um, as well. Um, as someone who sits on the interagency um, group, would you support the Environmental Justice um, Council and your group having some input into the way that the public engagement process is conducted for S5? Um, 
so it's hard to speak to that because it's still that group, both those groups are still figuring out what are they going to be doing? What's the next task? And so I don't know to what extent that those groups will have the capacity to look at um, what's happening with specific bills. I think probably what they're going to be doing is focusing on where they can have the biggest impact. And um, I do think one challenge with that here is that the policy is being set in this uh, this bill. And so um, there's not going to be a lot of flexibility in terms of what the commission is able to do um, uh, on some of these measures when the, the policy has been set already. And so I don't know how much energy those committees would spend on providing that advice. Um, at the commission, we would certainly welcome it and we would look for as much input as possible. Um, and, it, and if the legislature were to order that to be a priority, then those committees would do that as well. Uh, but on all these issues, we would definitely defer to the testimony you heard from Jay Green on, uh, at the Office of Equity. Um, uh, so I just would note in terms of the timeline and bringing all of these things together, of course, we're also working with legislative council on knitting those things together and we'll be hearing from them this afternoon on the timeline. I expect that they're probably reaching out to you and making sure that all of these things are cohesive as well, but we are also working on it, just to represent our staff and earlier. Thank you for coming in for your testimony. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, members, we have a witness who's been very patient uh, and she's in Oregon. And I think maybe if we could take a three minute break and come back, we'll probably go past the noon hour at this point. Just heads up. You can take it. All right, we are going to reconvene our meeting and um, welcome Corianne Wind with the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. Welcome Corianne. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yep, okay. So for the record, um, I wanna introduce myself. My name is Corianne Ann Wind. I work for the state of Oregon with the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality. And my role here is as the program manager for the Oregon Clean Fuels Program. So uh, first off, thank you for inviting me to uh, present today. Um, I, my goal here is to basically explain how the clean fuels program works and trying to get into kind of that, um, some of the interactions between what is being proposed in Vermont for a clean heat standard. Um, I understand that that is different than uh, <laughs> the scope of what the clean fuels program is because it is uh, heat, heating oil versus transportation fuels. But I think the way that the bill is designed and envisioned is that it, it, it has the same uh, similar framework. And so then if you do have questions about how, you know, I, I think a lot of the testimony um, preceding this was a, had a lot to do with um, implementation issues or enforcement or monitoring or those kinds of, you know, uh, following up on performance metrics for program, those kinds of things. Hopefully um, what I'll be presenting today about how we run our clean fuels program kind of can create those parallel kind of like uh, situations for you so you can uh, understand how it might uh, work in, in the future for a clean here, uh, heat standard in um, Vermont. So um, I need to share my screen, right? Do you have share screen? Okay. Can you yep. share? Uh, can you see my screen now? We can. Um, it's not a slideshow. If you want to make it a little bigger, you could make it a slideshow. Okay. No, that's actually probably a little worse because now we have two slides up at the same time. Because <laughs> I've got the wrong window going. <clears throat> uh, let's see because it's got that, uh, how do we get out of here? 
<laughs> yeah, I think because I've grabbed the wrong screen, let's try this again. It's fine, we can read these, they're bigger. Oh, there you go. Better? Yeah, that did it. Okay. So let, let me start by, actually, let me get rid of that one. That's better. Um, okay, so what the goal of the Clean Fuels Program in the state of Oregon is, it's the goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from its transportation fuels. Um, and so this is a program that we um, began implementing in Oregon in 2016. Um, and so we've got, you know, the first kind of seven years um, under our belt as far as implementing this. This is a policy that was created um, by UC Davis for the state of California. Um, and so California al also runs um, this program as well. And they've been implementing this in, since 2010, actually. So they, it, their program does predate us. Um, um, it was valuable for us to be able to take something that has been implemented in California um, and then be able to customize it for the state of Oregon, where uh, it is not identical, but it is a harmonization of the programs just so that the market for the fuel providers and, and those that are subject to the standard have the same general uh, rules of the game as far as how to participate in the program. And so they, it is valuable there. Um, I, I think another thing that I would point out and why it was really nice to um, be implementing this with, um, with um, other states is that a lot of, of the technical kind of um, points of the program can be shared, that we don't have to recreate the wheel um, and we'll, I'll get into that a little bit more in, in future slides. Um, so basically what this does is what, I'll, I'll break down this graph for you. And so beginning in 2015, this is a baseline year for our program. Um, we look at the carbon intensity of Oregon's transportation fuels. Um, in 2015, uh, by and large, our transportation fuels were gas and diesel. And so you take the carbon intensity of those fuels. And when I refer to carbon intensity, um, similarly as, as in your clean heat, heat standard proposal, it is life cycle emissions of how those fuels are produced. So what is it made from? Where does it come from? How is it refined? How does it get transported for to Oregon? As well as how is it combusted in, in a motor vehicle for in our case, but it could be in, in other kind of um, sources as well. So you take what that uh, the amount of greenhouse gases that are emitted from those fuels, and we averaged it for the over across the state. And then in ensuing years, we decrease the standard, or we make the reductions from the 2015 years more and more stringent. So as you can see from the shape of this curve, starting in 2016, then is the first year that we implemented increasing amounts of reductions that are required. So. First, you know, quarter percent, a half percent, one percent um, um, reductions. Uh, we are in 20, 30, 2023 now. We are re, uh, requiring a six and a half percent reduction of the overall uh, carbon emissions from when we started in 2015. Um, and and I'm going to make a little comment about the shape of this particular curve. You know, we know that in the fuel sector, it does take time to build capacity, to expand capacity for technology to kind of take over and, and, and really um, be able to reduce the carbon emissions from these fuels. And so you can see on the early years, we did have really, really minor uh, reductions. And then as capacity and as technology takes over, much steeper reductions moving out into the future. So when we passed our first bill in um, for this program, it required the Department of Environmental Quality to set out standards out into 10 years for the program. So from 2015 to 2025, a reduction of 10% from its baseline year. 
Um, what we have done last year in 2022 is additional rulemaking to expand the program. And so, you know, this is greenhouse gas emissions related. And, you know, um, to do to 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 set regulatory certainty about the reductions that we expect from this program in the context of our state uh, greenhouse gas climate goals. Um, we felt that it was necessary to do the rulemaking to expand the program. So last year, we did expand the program beyond 2025 out to 2035. And so you can see here that out into 2035 now, we're requiring a 37% reduction in average carbon emissions from our 2015 baseline year. And I remind you too here that we're talking about life cycle emissions, it's not tailpipe emissions. Um, but what that 37% life cycle reductions actually does represent almost 50% of tailpipe emissions reductions. And so in many, many state action goals, uh, that is that, and that's what we have in the state of Oregon is an interim reduction of 50% of emissions by a 2035 timeframe. So that is this, this, this program will be consistent and, and reduce its proportional share of greenhouse gas emissions for the transportation sector. Um, so next we'll speak to kind of what the obligated parties are in the program. And so we speak to the fuels that are covered under the standard. And here the mandatory fuels is if you import gasoline, diesel, ethanol, biodiesel, or renewable diesel into state, you are the obligated parties. Um, An import for us means if you own title to the fuel as it crosses into the state of Oregon. Uh, Oregon does not have any refineries and we only have a small handful of in-state producers that actually produce transportation fuel. So uh, by and large, the importers are who owns title to the fuels as they enter the state. And so these uh, fuel providers then uh, must register with the program. Um, they must um, submit quarterly reports about the different types and amounts of fuels that they're bringing into the state on a quarterly basis. Um, and then on an annual basis, must then demonstrate that they are attaining the, clean, the annual clean fuel standards. Um, and those, again, those, those standards get more and more stringent over time. Um, so those for, if you're handling those five fuels, gas, diesel, ethanol, biodiesel, renewable diesel, you must participate. Um, what then you have on the second kind of second list of fuels. So you talk about your natural gas products, propane, electricity, hydrogen, and sustainable aviation fuels. So these are what we consider opt-in fuels. So they're not required to participate, but the reason why you would want to participate is because these are lower carbon fuels that can generate credits in the program, right? So um, this program works on a series of credits and deficits. Uh, credits and deficits are both measured in a ton of greenhouse gas emissions reductions. Um, and so um, similar to your proposed clean uh, heat measures, right? The list of the different types of uh, projects are, um, that can qualify under uh, the clean heat measures. We, what we do is we have these fuels that can, we know because they're lower, you know, can generate credits. And so if you opt into the program, again, report to us how much of uh, what you're providing, that is the mechanism to generate these credits. And then these entities that provide those voluntary fuels can actually sell those credits into the market where the mandatory fuel reporters, which are primarily the higher carbon um, fuel providers, you know, um, can purchase. So that's kind of the market aspect of, of how this works. Um, and I, I, I think I'll stop there for this for, for this slide. Okay. So when I speak about the different kinds of clean fuels, um, there are a vast number of different kinds of alternatives to fossil gas and fossil diesel that we are talking about. Um, we do work very closely with the California Air Resources Board on this particular slide. 
And so what this is, is that a producer of these fuels will come to the agencies and submit um, 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 an application. Basically, it's it's they run this GREET model. So G-R-E-E-T is the model, and it's developed by the Argonne National Laboratory. It is the state of science as far as how you calculate what uh, carbon intensities are for transportation fuels. And so what this model considers is all of the energy inputs and greenhouse gas implications of the life cycle of a fuel. And so a producer of biodiesel, for example, will submit, will run this model and submit it to the agency with supporting documentation to basically calculate out what the carbon emissions are. Um, and then the agency um, reviews all of that documentation and approves a carbon intensity for that fuel. Um, because we're talking about life cycle emissions, um, it is custom for every producer of a fuel to um, need its own carbon intensity. Because if you're talking about something like biodiesel, you know, um, is it made from soybeans or is it made from used cooking oil? Is it made in a facility that burns coal for its electricity or does it have biomass you know, running it? The emissions are vastly different. Is it made in Iowa or is it made in Oregon, right? And the transportation distance to get to the market. All of those things matter, which means that every producer actually comes into the agency and asks for one of these carbon scores. So what you see on this um, on chart here is a summary of the different applications that, that are approved by the state of Oregon to participate in, um, in the clean fuels program. Um, so what I'll note here is that on the um, X axis, the carbon intensity values, the carbon intensity of gas and diesel, fossil gas and fossil diesel are approximately 100. And the units here are grams of CO2 equivalents per megajoule. And we use this measure because we are dealing with liquid fuels, gaseous fuels, electricity, whatnot. So we uh, normalize to the megajoule. And so uh, for fossil diesel, fossil gas, it's about 100. And so what you see here is that for every circle on this chart is a different pathway. So this is a different producer that has come and gotten a score from us. And these are the approved values. And so what you can see here is this wide range of fuels that actually um, range from, you know, minus 750, I believe is kind of that far left dot for electricity, um, all the way up to hydrogen, which, you know, um, and that would be a, a fossil based hydrogen that is kind of in that, you know, closer to like 180 or, or something like that. Um, you'll see a lot of the liquid biofuels. So biodiesel, ethanol, renewable diesel, renewable naphtha is something that's um, um, uh, liquid fuel, propane, all of those things. You know, they are lower carbon than the, um, the gas and diesel and they range all the way down to basically zero. Uh, what you see in the electricity and the compressed natural gas, the ones that are negative, these are ones that are primarily um, made from feedstocks and something like uh, uh, animal manures that are then run through digesters. So whether it's uh, cow, dairy manure, swine, um, those kinds of manures, be and then run through either they're just uh, creating uh, renewable natural gas that can be run in a natural gas truck or put through a generator to produce renewable electricity. And the reason why that these are negative are because um, if, if, if that manure was not put into these digesters and used for this uh, reason, they would be land applied and all of the methane would just be fugitively emitted, right? So part of taking the methane and creating a product of fuel from it is to avoid those fugitive emissions. And that's how you get negative carbon intensities. <coughs> um, so in Oregon, we probably have about 190 
probably pushing 200 right now of these applications that we have approved. Um, and we also, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and um, um, one of the, the latest things that most recent things that we've implemented our program to is not only our producers submitting these applications to the um, to the agency, but we are also requiring third party verification of these of these pathways as well. So another set of eyes, uh, because there are so much data behind uh, these producers and these pathways. Um, so another set of eyes to basically confirm that uh, what we're using here in the clean fuels program is accurate. And the reason why there's so much emphasis placed on what the accuracy of those carbon intensities are is because the lower the carbon intensities, the more credit generation is pot potential therefore, and then the more money that is associated with those credits. Um, and so what I'm showing here is that um, since the beginning of the program in 2016, these are the transactions for the credits in the clean fuels market, right? So again, as I mentioned in the first slide, the providers of these cleaner fuels generate these credits and they can be sold to other parties. So what the blue bars are, are the number of credits that are being transferred. And what the green line is, is the trend in the average credit prices. And so there was a period of time, you see kind of in the 2019 period where the um, peak of the credit prices got to about $160, $165 per credit. And again, that's per ton of JHGs reduced here. Um, and it is really normalized out for the past several years, kind of in this $120 range. Um, the, the average credit price for the for 2022 was $119. Um, I will note that um, I don't have a picture of this, but in the California market right now, the credit prices are about 60 or $65 a ton. And so it is interesting how, you know, yes, California is a bigger market and a bigger state, but they have different standards and they have different fuels. And so, you know, this is just your basic kind of concepts of economics about how many credits, how many are needed how many are being generated, and that is what kind of that influences uh, the supply and demand of those credits, influences what those credit prices are. Um, and so right now, uh, our credit prices in Oregon are actually higher than those in California. And what that indicates for us is that there is um, an economic advantage for a clean fuel provider to bring fuels to the state of Oregon over California. Um, so obviously there are a lot more logistics um, that are involved in contracting and how do you get certain fuels to Oregon as opposed to to California and all those kinds of things. But one of the things that does um, direct the decisions of those of these clean fuels producers to bring the fuels to the market are the credit prices. Um, in this in 2022, this market was worth about, $185 million. So again, this is like a new program since 2016. And this is the kind of economic activity that it has uh, spurred for the state of Oregon. And I remind you here too, this is not a tax. So this is not like the agency or the state assesses these fees on a program and then the revenue comes to the state of Oregon. It's not that. This is a a uh, financial transaction between credit generators and deficit generators, you know, people that need those credits to comply. And it is completely outside the purview of the state as far as uh, what, what that transfer uh, of funds is. Um, and additionally, there are no requirements by the program of how they have to use the revenue um, um, as well. Um, this is you know, this is a market-based program that we allow the participants to make those decisions about what's the most effective way to comply, which fuels to pick, how to like partner with, with different kinds of companies. Um, and so we've seen a really good kind of response across the board as far as like how 
fuel providers um, have reacted um, to the requirements. So what I want to do now is translate those credit prices, right? So I refer to you know the, the, the fuels that can provide credits and they can sell those credits, but what does it really mean in, in, in what context? Um, and so I'm going to start first at the top two lines. So in Oregon, we require um, all gasoline to have 10% ethanol and all diesel to have 5% uh, diesel. So those are our base fuels. Um, those are the base fuels that we baked into our baseline. And so if a provider of these fuels, again, these are the higher carbon fuels, if they um, do nothing else than the status quo of what they were doing in 2015, there is a cost to this program. So, you know, um, if you have to, if you're providing these fuels, you're generating deficits, you're going to have to buy def, uh, credits to offset that price. So in 2022, that translates into about six cents per gallon um, for gasoline and about seven, excuse me, 7.9 cents per gallon for diesel, right? So if you do nothing, that is the cost to comply with the program. But what you'll see in the following lines below that is the ways that the credit generation can actually help incent uh, trans, um, you know, transitioning to these lower carbon fuels. And so the most, uh, so in the next line here is a B20. So a B20 is a really common blend in the state of Oregon. Uh, we've had a lot of 20% uh, biodiesel blends in the state for several years. And because the biodiesel that is used to blend is credit generating, um, there are many, many truck stops that you can go to where they offer a B20, a B20 blend where the cost of the B20 is cheaper than the cost of the B5, right? It's that credits that are attached to it that are being sold and then passed on to the fuel consumer in this sense um, and for, for about two cents per gallon. Um, it is when you go and actually go to the truck stops, I mean, you can even see a more, uh, a bigger delta in the prices between the B20s and the B5s. And, but this would be an example of how a higher blending of a lower carbon fuel actually helps the consumers on the, on the, the, the you know, as, as the truck owners um, being able to provide a fuel that you don't have to change your truck for at all and you can still use. Um, and, and, you know, and so be, below that, so what happens if you're using like 100% biofuel or 99% biofuel? You know, if you're using like a biodiesel that's made from canola. So the credits associated with that are in, in the range of 54 cents per gallon. If you use something like a used cooking oil biodiesel that we have had um, a lot of in, this, in the state of Oregon as well, you can see um, because it's a waste product and it's used cooking oil, the carbon intensity there is much lower than that of the canola. Um, and so then those lower CIs generate more credits. And so now you're talking about a dollar fifteen cents per gallon that you're generating from the credits that are bringing down the price of the fuel as well. And, uh, and then and then another example, uh, like a tallow based renewable diesel. That's another situation where the carbon intensity is like a thirty, right? So we're talking about seventy percent reductions in greenhouse gases. And it translates into about a 98.5 cent per gallon uh, value. So this is so right. We're not trying to stick with the status quo of what the the high carbon fuels that we're using now. We're really trying to incent the transition to lower ones. Um, just just for comparison's sake as well, I, I did include on this slide on the bottom um, electricity because in the transportation fuels um, space. Uh, electrification is a big deal. And um, whether it's in a light duty passenger vehicle or heavy duty truck, um, electricity in the state of Oregon is pretty clean. Um, and so you see these um, about 60% reduction in carbon um, going from um, you know, a fossil fuel to electricity as well. And that translates into, um, in this sense, the electricity kilowatt hours, so about a 7.6 and then a 14 cent uh, uh, amount of uh, savings as far as um, uh, the electricity. 
Um, we also do have provisions for if you're using renewable electricity, so zero carbon, and then you you know then you're getting um, um, value out of those credits in the range of like 12 to 20 cents per kilowatt hour. And as a comparison, uh, average uh, um, price of electricity in Oregon is about, I would say nine to 12 cents, right? So what the credit generation from converting to an electric vehicle really does is it, it pays for the amount of, for, it pays for the price of electricity and then some, and then you can use that revenue to also, you know, make more improvements towards transitioning the, the, the you know, to electric vehicles as, as well. So it's been really handy um, in a state like Oregon, where we don't have a ton of public money that's honestly, you know, in grants, in incentives directly to incent this, but, you know, this, this market based program and the ability to generate these credits have become a pretty significant kind of line item in somebody's project costs. Okay. So I just wanted to end here actually with just kind of a recap of, of um, the what we have seen in the clean fuels program since its assumption in 2016. Um, for the state of Oregon, this is represented um, about 8 million tons of greenhouse gas uh, reductions um, over the course of the program. Um, that also translates into displacement of about 2 billion gallons of fossil diesel and gasoline for our transportation fuels. Um, the carbon intensity of even the biofuels that we have been using for several years, ethanol and biodiesel, gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And because it's the incentive to the producer to continuously uh, <clears throat> make changes to their processes and make it more efficient to produce and get it to market, you know, because of the life cycle nature of this, any point of this life cycle, you can make some reductions and, in, and, and, and make your um, carbon intensities lower. And then again, more credit generation, more value for that uh, biofuel. Um, so that the carbon intensities of those fuels have gotten cleaner as well. Um, and, and then the, the blend rates, especially on the biodiesel and the renewable diesel and the diesel pool side, you know, uh, I, I, as I mentioned, the, the requirement for the state of Oregon is a 5% blend rate. Um, but we have seen because of the credit generation from biodiesel and renewable diesel that uh, like there are quarters that have been up to 15%, right? So displacing fossil diesel. And I want to say we just are starting to look at our Q4 data from 2022. And um, they told me, my, my staff has told me that I think for the Q4, these blend rates are up to 20%. So 20% of the diesel pool is now renewable. So that's, that's remarkable for us. Um, and then just this, this last portion too, um, I know we're not really talking a, a ton about electricity today. I mean, but I guess there are some clean heat measures that, that, that can take advantage of electricity. Um, but one of the provisions in, in the program right now is, is the role of the electric utilities that provide um, um, electricity to charge electric vehicles. Um, and so um, instead of, you know, I, I have the example of Iona Leaf and, you know, there are in Oregon, there's probably about 60,000 EVs right now registered. And I have no interest in cutting a check or, you know, issuing credits to 60,000 different individuals. So what we do is we roll up and we aggregate those credits to the utilities that you, where you live. And so my utility is Portland General Electric, so they get my credits. Um, and then they are, uh, they have oversight by the Public Utility Commission about how, what to do with those credits, how to sell them, and then how do they invest those um, those credits to then benefit all of the ratepayers in these utilities, and for this provision in the program, it has generated like almost fifty million dollars worth of revenue to the utilities that they have then turned around and invested. So in grants to a lot of community-based organizations uh, for electric vehicles, electric vehicle charging, 
um, um, the first of Oregon's electric school buses, um, education and outreach campaigns, just a lot of, uh, you know, a, a vast portfolio of different ways where the state's uh, electric utilities are really kind of diving in, um, you know, in, into the space of decarbonizing transportation as well. And so that is the end of my presentation. And I guess I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I, I'm curious about who, is it your PUC that stood up this program? Uh, no, so the, our program is uh, implemented by the Department of Environmental Quality. So we're the environmental regulators for the state of Oregon. Um, we do work in partnership with the Public Utilities Commission, but only on this electric utility space. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony today. Uh, just curious, can you tell me what your primary source of generation of power is in the state of Oregon? Uh, yeah, most of our electricity, um, we, we still do have a, a pretty broad portfolio. I would say the majority of it is natural gas um, and then hydro uh, from the Columbia River system. Um, we do have still, we have some, um, you know, increasing portions of renewable and solar and wind. Uh, we also do still have some imported coal um, in the mix as well. Um, there is a complementary uh, regulation. It's our clean energy bill from 2021 that will require that uh, to be uh, all of the state's electricity to be zero carbon by 2040, I believe. So that is something that's separately regulated. And do you have, uh, do you have any nuclear plants? Um, I, we don't have any nuclear plants in Oregon. I think we might still have some in the region where we might be importing some electricity that is um, from nuclear. All right, thank you. Representative Stebbins. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much for this testimony. I, I personally find it helpful. Can you, uh, I don't know if you were around back in 2016, but when, when this program was being proposed, as compared to now, um, do you have any observations in terms of how various stakeholders and in particular the obligated parties like responded in 2015 and now today? Um, absolutely. I've started with the program. Actually, the, the, the authorizing bill for this program actually goes back to 2009, Oregon legislature. I joined the program in 2010 in its initial stakeholder and rulemaking advisory committee kind of process. So I have been with the program from, from almost the beginning. Um, it, there has been a lot of involvement from stakeholders um, and a lot of change since the beginning. Um, I, I would say back in 2010, 2011, 2013 even, um, you know, it was a brand new policy. Um, it's a complicated, policy. It is different because it's market-based. It is different than a lot of the command and control regulatory programs that the agency runs. Um, we, I think there was a lot of just learning that needed to be done. And um, I think a lot of fear about how this was going to affect the price of fuels in the state. Um, a lot of the opponents of the bill said, oh, it's going to raise the price of gas and diesel. They hired consultants. It's going to be a buck a gallon difference, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, in a worst case scenario um, situation, um, I could, I, I definitely uh, um, can see how the, you know, again, I, you know, you point to like, if you do nothing, of course, there's going to be a cost of compliance. And, and as, as you know, the, the requirements get straight more and more stringent, then of course, this, that, the cost is going to go higher. Um, what I think has been really helpful since we've begun implementing is that now we have real life kind of experience and stories about what is actually happening, as opposed to kind of, you know, forecasting and, and, and modeling what we think is going to happen. Um, what we've seen is that the price of fuels has not uh, significantly increased. 
Um, and um, as I showed a lot of times, it has decreased. Um, when you switch off of uh, the liquid fuels and when you start talking about things like natural gas and propane electricity, I mean, the fuel itself is just cheaper. Um, and, and then you add on the credit generation for that, and it really makes it um, a cost-effective way to um, talk about decarbonizing this sector of the economy. Um, I think the investments that have been made by the utilities, again, you know, like, but for the clean fuels program revenue, there wouldn't be electric school buses in Oregon anymore. Um, I, you know, there's just a lot of anecdotal case studies now where fleets and governments um, and other programs and, and just um, um, have really seen the benefits of this program. You know, the benefits here are not just in greenhouse gas reductions. Um, all of these cleaner fuels have reduced tailpipe pollution. And so you're having improvements in public health. Um, we're sh and we're seeing just, you know, improvements in air quality because those tailpipe emissions um, have been reduced. Um, when we did our rulemaking last year to expand the program, we did contract. We worked with the UC Davis um, Institute of Transportation Studies to model what some of those public health benefits would be. And, you know, the reduced particulate matter in and of itself is just, you know, was estimated by about $90 million in savings as far as avoided health costs annually from the program. And again, to like continue to, um, you know, to reduce those uh, tailpipe emissions as well into the future. And so, you know, uh, for folks that are concerned about high asthma rates um, in Oregon, which we do have really high asthma rates, or the fact that because these are transportation emissions and communities that are uh, live most closely to these high pollution transportation corridors, uh, um, corridors are environmental justice communities and they benefit um, um, more from the reductions in these transportation emissions. You know, those have all kind of played into um, really, I think, bringing support to be much more widespread um, than was um, initially um, anticipated and initially seen back in the beginning of the program. So that, that's been re really nice to see. And I would, I would also say that, you know, the, the, the fuel providers themselves, right, um, they, it was a brand new market and a brand new program, and they had no idea how it was going to play out. And now that they have experience doing this and the emergence of, you know, much lower carbon fuels and a lot of renewable diesel and renewable natural gas, again, you know, it's like um, they have figured out ways to get those products into the state um, and distributed amongst the fleet. So I think more and more companies are benefiting from the program. And I think that's been really good to see. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. That was really helpful. Mm -hmm. All right, committee, we will um, adjourn for the morning.